So this is the new Critical Dusk, and this is definitely going to be controversial in some fashion. Whether you like or dislike Crin, this is an important release, and I think it's going to significantly impact the market in a number of ways. But it's also not all good things, and so in my opinion, the controversy is justified, and there are some key drawbacks to be aware of. The full story here is a bit more complicated than just is it good or is it bad. And in this video, I'm going to try and give you a perspective on this uh, for how I see it. And I want you to let me know if you agree uh, or what you think once you're done watching it. So without further ado, let's get into it. Now first, let's get some disclaimers out of the way. This unit was sent by Shenzhen Audio, uh, obviously at Krin's request. But of course, I haven't been paid to say anything in particular about it, and all thoughts and opinions here are my own. Big thanks to Shenzhen Audio for sending it in. But with that said, I do have some biases here. Krin is a friend of mine, and we occasionally sponsor his content. Decide how much that matters to you. Certainly, I haven't pulled any punches in the past with regards to his previous collabs. And just to give a bit of context, I liked the original Dusk, I liked the Truthier Red, I did not like the Singolo, I did not like the Truthier Blue or the Dioko, even though I could understand why he did them that way. And I was a bit mixed on the rest. Now, let's talk about what this is. So, this is the box, uh, and this, as you can see, is the Moondrop X Critical Dusk, not the Blessing 3 Dusk, which would be sequential from the previous Blessing 2 Dusk. This is confusing, but it has effectively been unblessed. There is, of course, the cartoon child on the box in typical modern IEM marketing fashion. It's always nice to see the cartoon children, I guess. And you also get two frequency response graphs on the back of the box. One of them is done on the 7-11 coupler, and the other is done on the newer BNK 4620 or 5120 equivalent. This one has the more accurate acoustic impedance. And you can see here the intended tunings, and I say tunings plural because the unique and potentially controversial part about this IEM is that in addition to this fairly mediocre 3.5 millimeter cable, you also get this considerably nicer uh, DSP cable to be used with mobile devices. So there's a USB-C connection here. Now this gives you access to the Moondrop Link app, which has a number of tuning presets in it, which as of filming this video right now is also a uniquely terrible app. Like <laughs> it's awful, but I'll talk more about that later. And you also get this really nice leather carry case and in my view, this is actually one of the better feeling cases that exist in the wild. Like, if you compare it to, like, the old cases that they had, I think this is much nicer. And you also get three sets of spring tips. Now, I personally feel that more tips could have been included, but maybe Crin is also trying to force these onto the community. <laughs> I'm personally fine with them. Like, I think they're good tips, but I would have preferred to see additional tips uh, just so that, you know, people can experiment. Now, onto the IEM itself. While the shell is quite large, I love the charcoal look to the faceplate, and I also find it ergonomically excellent, unlike some of Critical's other collabs. Like, some of the more recent ones have not fit me that well, but these ones I have no problem with. So, while it's large, uh, it fits flush in my ear, and I can wear them all day. The nozzle thickness is approximately 5.7 millimeters, and for the nozzle length, it's around 5 millimeters, measured from the contour of the shell. And the driver configuration is also a bit different with this one. It's using two dynamic drivers for the base, two balanced armatures for the mids, and two planar magnetic tweeters, which is the twist with this one. And when I first learned about this, I was not expecting that. But there you go. You have the upper treble being handled by two planar magnetics. So that's interesting. Okay, so now let's get into the sound, and this is where things are going to get a bit weird. So the Dusk can essentially be thought of as a Swiss army knife of sorts but it's also more and less than that. And I think you'll see what I mean. And we kind of have to evaluate its performance both with the 3.5 millimeter analog mode being run from a typical source like an amplifier, and we also have to evaluate it with the DSP cable because that's where you get the DSP presets. And in my opinion, that's really what this IEM is all about. In fact, and this is a separate point, to me, this product's existence in the market will likely do a lot to help people learn what really matters when it comes to sound quality. And it is categorically not differences in source gear. But let's go through it, and we'll start by looking at the 3.5mm analog mode. So, here we are on the BNK5128. As usual, we're showing this relative to the preference bounds that we've lifted from the Harman research. So, for the Dusk in analog mode, we can think of this as effectively the foundational tuning for this IEM. And I'm showing you here an average between the two channels, since the channel matching on this unit isn't perfect in a couple of spots. I've been told that this is within the manufacturing tolerances, so once again, decide how much of an issue that is for you, but note that this is a Moondrop thing, not a critical thing. And I've also measured this with multiple seatings and with different insertion depths, and I'll post all those results in the forum thread linked below. 
In any case, I would consider the Dusk in analog mode to be a reasonable but not exceptional tuning. Uh, I think many will also prefer this over the original Dusk, but not in all cases. So the bass is elevated here, it's solid, punchy, and engaging. I don't find it to be overbearing or intrusive though. The mid-range is a little bit forward in a couple of areas, and for the treble, while it's mostly within the preference bounds, there is some notable coloration here, particularly in the lower treble, uh, that causes a bit of shrillness, and in the upper treble right here, you can see there's definitely some zing up there. I mentioned this in my recent First Impressions live stream of this IEM that I did, uh, that the upper treble kind of jumped out at me a bit. I called it like a crunchy kind of sound, and I think that's still how I would describe it. It's not like sibilant or overly harsh or anything like that. It's just that the upper edges of certain tones get enhanced a little bit, almost like there's kind of like an outline being drawn around those tones. And while it is too much of a boost for me, at the same time, I think there are people who will like this. And I think that there's this pervasive thought in the community that more upper treble air or more zing makes an IEM more resolving. And if you found the original Dusk to be a bit dull, this may actually be preferable by comparison. But I also think that the trend of boosting the upper treble is a bit of a crutch. Yes, it can add a bit of excitement, but more importantly, an upper treble boost can mask potential harmonic imbalances lower down. Can't tune the treble well? We'll just slap on an extra 10 dB of air above 10 kHz. Done. I am complete. No, I'm joking, of course. But there is a sense in which adding upper treble is a safe bet for manufacturers, given that A, people often perceive this as added resolution, and B, you can't control for every individual's length mode resonances and how the rest of the treble will be perceived. So while I get it, I just prefer it a bit less zingy. And it turns out that Critical also prefers it to be a bit less zingy, because this region gets cut when using the default intended sound signature from the DSP cable. So let's talk about that now. Now one thing we are currently investigating is that there are reports of some USB noise, and at the moment it's unclear if this is to do with the product or if it's just to do with crappy USB outputs. But we're trying to get to the bottom of it and I'll update the form thread once we find out. So, with the DSP cable, you get a number of presets. The first is the Dusk default preset. This is far and away the most interesting one because it just so happens to measure very closely to JM1 with 2018 filters and the recommended 3 kHz adjustment. And I just said a bunch of words that if you're not following this space closely, will mean nothing to you. So, what am I talking about? This is something that we've talked at length about in the past. I'll leave resources in the description for that. But the key thing for IEMs is that we're using a population average ear transfer function for the baseline, since the outer ear is getting bypassed with IEMs and we don't want to bake in rig specific pinna effects. Basically, the Dusk default preset with the DSP cable measures very well relative to a population average for the ear gain, and you will get a bit of editorialization there with extra bass and upper treble. So I would describe this as a little bit of a U-shaped presentation, but it's, it's extremely well done. And just on that note, the upper treble is curbed a bit compared to the analog mode, but it is still tastefully present. So how does this sound? It sounds absolutely incredible, like chef's goddamn kiss. This is really what, in my view, IEMs should strive to sound like. It sounds balanced, natural, no glaring or fatiguing treble features, no honk in the mid-range, just smooth, clean, clear, it's, it's just exceptional. Like, this is some of the best mids that I've heard on any IEM. And when you go from the 3.5 millimeter mode to the Dusk default preset with a DSP cable, I imagine that you will hear what I mean. It's so much cleaner and more focused. It sounds more spacious. And, at least in my view, all of this goes to show that if you get an IEM to reasonably agree with your head-related transfer function, to agree with what your brain expects sound to be due to your anatomy, it's going to be more well-received for these subjective qualities. Now, of course, not everybody's going to have the same HRTF. You may be a person whose ear transfer effects impart the expectation of more treble energy or less treble energy. It may also not fit with your preferences for bass and treble. But at least to me, the Dusk default preset sounds normal in the best of ways. Maybe with a slight U-shape to it, but again, tastefully done. But for all of your other preferences, if you want a different sound signature, Crin has you covered with additional presets. So you've got your V-shape preset with extra bass and extra treble. You have bass plus, which is a bit of a meme, but for bass heads, that's more bass. But then you've got two other interesting ones that I want to touch on, namely Harmon and the DF tilted preset. So for the Harmon preset, it measures like this relative to population average calibration, which is what we're currently using for the baseline here. It's still mostly within the preference bounds, but you can see it's considerably more forward in the lower treble. But I'll switch over to the Gross system here to show you how closely this unit matches with Harmon IE. 
You can see that there's a little bit of a dip there in the treble, but I expect that this is due to the fact that this is being measured on the official Gross ARIO 402 coupler, which has some damping there for the coupler length mode resonance. But on the whole, I would say this is a fairly good representation of a Harman tuning. Now, this is of course a controversial target because it seems in listening experiments, people like it, but spend any amount of time in IEM communities and you realize that many people do not. Of course, there are reasons for this, in part because of how varied IEM preferences can be. And again, I've gone over all of that in a recent video, but it has to be said, there absolutely are people who are going to enjoy this tuning, who are going to prefer this tuning. So it is nice that it's been included. Now, of course, I personally find it to sound lean and shrill and particularly unnatural. I've had basically the same criticisms of it that many have had. And thankfully, it seems there's now additional research being done now with the 5128's more accurate acoustic impedance. So we'll see what happens there. I'm going to keep an eye on that. But even still, in the preliminary research, it shows that both trained and untrained listeners do enjoy this kind of tuning. And so it is good that it is here with the Dusk. And that's really what I find most interesting about this product. You have the Dusk's default option. Crin's preferred tuning with some subtle editorialization. And this is again, a very good fit with JM1 or population average based targets. And then you have good old Harman IE 2019 and people can choose between them. It's actually very easy to switch between them. Now they're not necessarily gonna be volume normalized, but this is a good way for people to try both. So if you've never heard either of them, here is your opportunity to do so in the same product and decide for yourself which one you prefer. And in that sense, Critical has effectively solved this debate with the same product. He's giving people both. Now, of course, there are more presets as well. And this brings me to the DF Tilted option, which unfortunately isn't. So it's supposed to be a preset that aims for DF with an 8 dB tilt. Why? Okay, so let me briefly touch on that. So diffuse field should not be considered a reference target. Almost nobody enjoys it. There's like one person who enjoys it. Shots fired. What's your favorite headphone? <laughs> Rather, it is the sound field that is appropriate for headphones and IEMs for stereo recordings since they are worn on the head. This is because in a diffuse field, the sound comes from all directions, effectively making it not localized to any one direction, like you get with speakers. So it provides a good fit for the use condition of headphones and IEMs, and it also matches the Harman in-room baseline with the same smoothing applied. However, it turns out that the people want more bass and less treble compared to flat DF. So it makes sense to tilt it, to have more bass and less treble. Well, you'd see it this way, more bass and less treble. Now, this should be seen as a rough estimate of the bass to treble delta that people prefer. And whether it's tilted by 8 dB or 10 dB or 12 dB, it's all kind of within the ballpark there. And even though it's not supposed to be a target curve, it kind of has become one as a result of the tilting. And that's what Critical is trying to achieve with this preset. But here's the problem. First of all, I don't expect this to be preferred by most people because apparently this is based on the 5128's diffuse field head related transfer function, which has pinna effects that are on the brighter end of the spectrum. So there's more ear gain there than there would be with population average. And it might work for those who have similar pinna effects, but probably not for most people. But in addition to that, it seems this preset also kind of whiffs it in the bass. So there's a substantial sub bass boost here, which isn't at all part of the DFHRTF. And I guess this is just part of Crin's preference for that. Uh, there are also some other odd features throughout the response here, as you can see. Uh, don't worry too much about this here. This is the rocking mode for IEMs, but there's still some other weirdnesses going on. So I would not call this preset DF tilted. Like I suppose for the ear gain, it's kind of close to DF plus eight, but I don't think this preset makes much sense. In fact, I think it probably should be redone. But in any case, as mentioned, you've been given options with this, and you've also been given the option of making your own custom presets. However, this is where, as of recording this right now, the custom EQ option does not build upon any of the selected presets. Rather, it makes the adjustments to the foundational response that you get. So if you wanna make adjustments to the default Dusk preset, the, the good one in my opinion, you have to first rebuild that preset in the EQ. And here are the values that you would need to get started with that. Uh, but it would be nice if, it was, if there was an option of doing this. Say for example, if you wanted the V-shape to be not quite as V-shaped or if you wanted 
you know, a different tilt for the DF tilt or something like that. And here's where I have to say that the app for all of this is just straight up terrible. Like, again, as of filming this right now, because things could improve with new versions, my goodness, do I hope they improve it. Like, it's nice to have the EQ available, but you're currently limited to just peak filters, which, okay. But the app also seems to have a hard time of actually applying the presets. Like, half the time, I would hit apply, and it wouldn't actually apply it. So that sucks. And I feel like I had the app crash on me more times than Adobe Premiere does, which is saying something. The other issue is that there's no app to be able to use this with a computer, at least not as far as I can find. If you can find one, let me know. Now, thankfully it does retain the presets on the cable, but it gets cumbersome if you wanna change things. Like I would love to be able to just use this with the USB cable here at my computer at my desk, and I can, but if I want to make adjustments to the preset, or whatever custom uh, preset that I have, I have to reconnect it to my phone, get back into that fairly broken app, uh, make the adjustments, and then swap back to my computer. So it's just cumbersome to do. It'd be much nicer if there was some way that I could just do it with my computer. It might be that the thinking here is that if you're using a computer, you can technically just make your own custom EQ anyways with the 3.5 millimeter analog mode and run it from your usual outputs. And you should do that. Like, that would be my advice for literally anybody with any device, um, with any headphone or IEM. But this is where the Dusk is actually less than the sum of its parts. So here's my perspective on all of this. There is a sense in which using DSP is effectively cheating. And I'm not saying not to use it. Again, you should use it for all the things. But if you think about what's actually being done here, it's really just a retune of the base platform. While the Dusk in analog mode is still a decent sounding IEM, and again, a solid foundation to build upon, it's not nearly as good as the Dusk default DSP preset with the DSP cable. Like, it's not even close. And part of me wishes that Kryn had been able to achieve that outcome in analog mode and just not bothered with the DSP cable. Like, if he'd been able to do that, there would be no controversy here. But of course, we end up with something that does considerably more than that. It's a Swiss army knife of well-known tunings and lots of customization possibilities. And while that has to be seen as a good thing, you can kind of already do this for free with other EQ software for any decent IEM without the need to engage with the janky app, right? Like even if even just this one, you can do that for free with three filters in any kind of custom EQ software. Like some IEMs will take more filters to achieve this tuning, but like to me, this feels a little bit like Critical saying, Yes, EQ is the way to improve everything. Here is just me having done it for you. <laughs> but with all that said, the Dusk is absolutely without question the product that I'd buy at the $350 mark if I plan to use it primarily with a phone and the DSP cable. And I also strongly feel that this is a product that's so important for people to better understand their own preferences, to better understand how they hear things. And it's also an important learning tool for people to get into EQ and understand that yes, EQ is in fact the way to get the best sound. Like I was thinking about it. The fact that the Dusk default preset is so good is like, that's like the validation for what all of us EQ proponents have been saying for such a long time. You can do all of this for free and it so dramatically improves the sound quality if you do it right. Stop being lazy, learn how to do it. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. When it comes to alternatives, it's really not that easy to think of anything since there aren't other things like this. As mentioned, the Dusk in analog mode is reasonably competitive with other products in the sub $500 price range, but I do think it's worth considering IEMs like the The Audio Hype 4. Uh, the Hype 4 also has some zingy upper treble, but I'd argue it actually has a better tonal balance for the rest of it. Like again, comparing no EQ, no DSP for both of them, I think that the Hype 4's default mid-range tuning is better. And if you are going to EQ it anyways, it would probably be in the same spot for both IEMs. For other IEMs, I think people will like this better than the original Dusk, uh, unless you're sensitive to that sort of you know crunchy upper treble. Um, and I also personally prefer this over the Blessing 2 and the Blessing 3. But I also want to give you some context for how good I feel the Dusk with DSP is. So for me, I actually prefer the Dusk default preset over the Monarch Mark II and the Monarch Mark III. Both of those are considerably more expensive. So like I said, the sound you get with the Dusk default preset is extremely good, or at least it works extremely well for me and what I like. I think the only other IEM that I'd personally consider for this kind of sound signature is the High Senior Megafest, and that's one that I have yet to listen to, but it is getting a review on this channel soon, so make sure you're subscribed for that. So in conclusion, yes, the Critical Dusk does get a thorough recommendation, but it's not without its foibles. And apart from wanting to say foibles in a video, it's worth considering your use case. 
If your primary use case is from a source where you can't make use of the DSP cable, you may want to consider if the default sound signature is the right one for you. But if you've got no issues with using it with the DSP cable, then yeah, this is one of the more important audio products on the market today. Anyways, that is it for me. And once again, if you guys are interested in the measurements, those will be posted up on the Headphone Community Forum. Also check out our written articles up on headphones.com. And of course you can chat with us and other like-minded audio folks in our Discord also linked below. Until next time, we'll see you guys later.